Oh my God, this is wow, nice. so many people. <laughs> this is quite intimidating. Uh, <laughs> Switch off your phone. Hi, <laughs> I'm Tom. This is Lars. We work on OS Build, and uh, today we're going to talk about what we do and why. Uh, so we figured that, well, sort of our starting point is that we thought that uh, the tools that we have available to build uh, operating systems uh, are not as good as they could be. And so we, we like, compared to the software development in general over the last 20, 30 years, whatever, it's like we have gotten a lot of cool new tools, like source control and, and so on, that has really improved how we are able to develop things, how the speed that we can do it, and the sort of the quality that we're able to produce. And I think we think that um, building operating systems are sort of lagged behind. So we are still, still very much ad hoc. Um, either the tools are really, really old, uh, they're reusing old things that don't really fit together, or people making new things, they do an ad hoc solution for exactly the new thing that they want to build. But we don't feel there was really a uh, sort of general purpose toolkit for uh, making the operating system of the future in a way, or like playing around to figure out how you want to do things. So we basically figured out there's some principles that we want to, uh, some of the, the tools that we want to, uh, to have, uh, to follow, and we'll talk about them first. So three things. We want them to be extendable, comprehensible, and for the process to be reproducible. Uh, so feel free to interrupt, by the way. Yeah, of course. I won't. Don't worry. Cool. Uh, so, firstly, extendable. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, so we want, uh, we want to be able to, like, once we have a tool to build an operating system, firstly, uh, it's not enough to be able to build just the operating system we have today. We want to be, you know, move toward the future. We want to build Fedora 40 and RHEL 15. Uh, so we want to make the tools that can do that. Uh, but it's not all, also, it's not really uh, enough to have a tool that can just build a brand the shiny new future long, long time from now, which, is, which can't handle the thing we have today. So we basically, we need something that can both do the past stuff, the current stuff, and the future stuff, and can move gradually um, between them. So we need some way of having our tools uh, modifiable in an easy way. Right, and one of the big points I always say, and this doesn't really fit in extendable, but it's like experimentable, experiment, happy to experiment. So um, right now it's very hard if you, you know, have like some way to build an operating system or to make an image, let's say, uh, to like just switch out one of the parts, right? Like, oh, I want to try like, a different bootloader because so much depends on it and it's very hard to, you need to understand the full, full stack and I think that's a big uh, thing we're trying to solve here. So yeah. just wanted to add that. Um, and the next thing, uh, comprehensible. Uh, so we, uh, we want the process uh, of building operating systems to be as easily understandable as you know, building software. Like you have a make file and it's verbose and it's you know, a bit complicated, but at least you can figure out the steps if you look into it and you spend some time. Uh, so we want the, the process that we have, like we have an input to our tools that describe the process that will happen to produce the operating system, and we want that to co cover all the things that we do. So there should be nothing that our tool does that is random, for instance. You don't put any, like you don't have any randomness that ends up in the image that we just make up in the tool. It should all be specified up front. So if you need some randomness, then you need to prov provide it to our tool. Or if there's some policies, for instance, um, uh, like you don't want to encode the policies in the tool because then in the future you want to make a new thing with a different policy, you have to change the tool itself. So it doesn't merely make it very easy to experiment. So that means that the in input to our tools is going to be very, very verbose and not the most easiest to, to quickly read, but it will cover all of the things. Um, so a very nice example that we always bring up uh, is the, in the kickstarts that we currently use a lot inside uh, Red Hat and Fedora. Uh, you have this uh, command called uh, auto part. Auto part. Auto part. Yeah. Amazing thing. It's very obvious, obvious what it does. It automatically partitions your disk. But what does that mean? Like, what does it mean to do automatically? Well, it depends, right? So depending on if you're on RHEL or on Fedora or which version you are, it does automatically different things. So just looking at the input, the kickstart, you don't really know what happens. And you have to look at the source code. And then you need to know the version that you're looking at and so on. So we don't want to do that. We want to, like, if you want to do partitioning, you need to specify exactly all the things that it needs which probably means that you, need, you want some tool that, to generate these things. But at least the, the low-level tool that build, builds a thing, it doesn't do any, any sort of um, policy. And lastly, reproducible. This is like, a, this, tool, this word conjures up lots of ideas in different people. And those people are very excited about reproducible builds and reproducible software uh, for like theoretical reasons. Uh, or, yeah. Uh, it's, like, it's very elegant and cool. But we don't really care about that. We are much more on a, on a practical level. So that if you um, say that I want to make a suggestion for how we build Fedora, 
And I, on, my, on my machine, I tried out the current way using our tool. Say, if we use that tool to build Fedora, I try out the current way and I make some change and I try it in the new way. And now I see that, oh, this works, it's cool, the tests pass, uh, and uh, this is what I want. Uh, but if I'm not confident that when I hand this change off to release engineering of Fedora, it has the same effect, then I can't really, you know, it's like, uh, it doesn't really help much. I cannot really do development, I cannot really contribute to Fedora if I'm not confident that what I do on my machine is the same thing I'm going to end up in release engineering. And currently, with the tools we have now, it really isn't the case. So that because the tools, when you run them, it really depends on the environment you run them in. So you must make sure that you exactly mimic what's going to happen in the end, uh, in your setup and so on, uh, in order for you to get the same results. And even then, it's not really clear exactly which things uh, matter and which things don't. So one of the main things we want to make sure is that whenever you have an input to our tool, the operating system image that it produces is always the same. And of course, the same, that, uh, what does it mean to be the same? Uh, we are not really interested in, well, like bit for bit uh, reproducibility would be cool, it would be amazing. But that's just not what we have, we can't do that. Uh, the tools that we have in general are not reproducible. And we're not really aiming for, we don't really need that. What we really need is that if you have produced two images with the same input, they are functionally equivalent. So we want to say something like, functional reproducibility, that they behave the same. You cannot detect the difference between them. So that's the bar we are aiming for. And of course, this is not mathematically well-defined exactly what that means, but that's sort of what we are, the aim we are going for. Cool, and let's talk a bit about the implementation. So those were the basic, the ideas behind the thing that we are making, uh, and then let's talk about how we did that. Um, so the tool we said earlier already, I think, I hope, OS build is what we're working on. And the, uh, sort of the, man the build manifest, so the input that we pass to our tool, we call a pipeline. It's a JSON document, and uh, it describes each of the steps that we want to do. And we say that we have a set of stages and uh, that each take a um, file system tree and modify it in some way. Uh, so it starts off with uh, an empty tree, and then we run a DNF stage on that tree, so that uh, populates it with RPMs, typically. I mean, you can, the whole point there is this, this should be something for experimentation, so you can then do things differently, or you can, you can do a git checkout here, you can do, install RPMs directly, you can do whatever you want, right? But this is the typical way that we are doing it at the moment. So you fill a, a tree with, a, with RPMs, and then maybe you want to change the host name, you install some grub config, you set up the users, you do maybe some enable or disable some system the units, you, you put in the FS tab, you configure the firewall, and maybe you want to drop in some uh, configuration that's going to happen on the first boot. It's like your Ansible playbooks or whatever else you want. We haven't implemented this, this is why it's great, we haven't implemented this, but this is like uh, the idea of it. And finally, of course, uh, SC-Linux, uh, the thing we all love. Uh, we uh, apply all the labels to the file system. So now what we have produced here, after all of the stages, is just a file system. We want that uh, our image should contain this file system, but we haven't actually made an image yet. And this, I mean, for the people who are used to building uh, images, this is sort of the other way around for how it's usually done. So usually you first set up an image, and then you fill it with stuff, and then, then you finish. But we first create a file system, and each of these things we can also cache, like or whatever, we can reuse them, or we can, and we can argue about them and uh, have tests about them to make sh just, just talking about the files. Uh, but we have, when we finish that, we have what we call an assembler, and we just take the file system tree and then put it into some image format. Uh, so you know, typically QCAP2, that's what we often do, uh, or other things. Um, and the point here is that we, we want to make sure that each of these things have a very um, distinct responsibility, that they don't overlap, uh, or, and they don't depend on each other in unpredictable ways. So for instance, the assembler should always put only the file system into the image, so we, when you mount it and you compare what was the input image and what's the thing that you put in there, in, what was the input tree, and what's the content of the image should always be exactly the same. Um, yeah, that's the, the big picture. Go. Do we want to talk about how they are like separated from each other? I would love to. Ah, well then go ahead, please. So, uh, so the, many of the tools that we have, all of the tools that we have, are, they are, they are basically built for modifying a running system. Like DNF is made, made for installing and updating packages on the system that you have, and Grub is made for installing the bootloader on your running laptop, which is not what we do at all. So these, these things don't really, and so they make some assumptions that don't really hold in our context. <clears throat> and this is a problem for uh, the current uh, that Lorax and Anaconda uh, installed at the moment, and 
all these things, we, we all face the same problem here, that how do you make sure that uh, DNF and Grub and so on don't get confused by the fact that the machine that you're running on is not the target machine that you're installing for. Uh, so the, typically what will happen is that they will maybe pull in the kernel command line from your current host. Uh, they will look into Etsy to find some configuration, what repositories do you have, and then they put it that into the, they use that to get packages, put it into the target. And what we, of course, want to do, that we want to, we want to make sure that our tool is completely um, independent from the host. So if I want to build RHEL 8.1 and I'm running a Fedora machine, of course I should be able to do that. I, I, currently, the tools we have, uh, with some of the tools we have, you need to have the same operating system on your host as you're building for, which is a bit odd. That's not how we may, you know, generally use soft, make software, and we don't avoid that. So uh, principle here is we want to make sure that each stage is separate from the host and from each other. So that the only there's no communication between the stages. So they operate on a shared tree one by one. Uh, but other than that, you don't pass any configuration between them. So if you want this to be, for instance, uh, maybe the, the grub stage needs some, config, some stuff about the file system, as does the FS tab stage, as does the thing you finally make on the, on the image, then you have to pass the same information in configuration to all of them. Uh, in order to be really only very strict that there can be no communication, uh, no leakage of information between them. And we run each of these things, uh, we run them in uh, end spawn containers, uh, or like the, the point is to have a, a container to make sure that this is really the case. Anything I forgot to talk about? I, wait, am I Yusuf Fleur? What, what? I'm Yusuf Fleur. Exactly, you're very good at it. Uh, right, so let me think that, yeah. So this is how it actually looks like. Uh, this is a JSON document. And uh, we have a list of stages, and then we have one assembler at the end. And we have named them just in reverse domain name notation, so we make sure that the names are unique. So we, we must make sure now that once we have made such a uh, uh, pipeline, uh, then we said it, well, it's reproducible. Right? That means that also in the future, if you have then an OS build tool made 10 years from now, uh, well, hopefully, uh, then it will still make the same image. So we cannot change the behavior of any of these things. So that's why we make sure that now we have or go as build DNF, and if in the future we realize we made a mistake there, we want DNF to behave in a different way. Hopefully we made it low level enough that that's never the case, because it's just really doing what DNF does. But if we made a mistake, we must make then a different DNF2 or whatever. Uh, that's fine, that's why we have named them in such a way, that we can easily add more things without ever taking away the old ones. Um, so another thing, another little quirk that uh, people working on these things are probably very used to is that, well, DNF, like having a DNF, uh, states well, like, using the tool is one thing, but of course DNF may change its behavior over time. So one thing we always make sure when we build images is we save the information about the build environment so that we can reproduce the build as closely as possible. And what we wanted to say is that the only thing that matters should be the things in this JSON manifest. Nothing else can possibly affect the outcome of the image, which means that if DNF, the version of DNF you're running could affect the outcome, then you better encode that somehow in the manifest. So that's why we introduced this, the notion of a build pipeline. So it's a sub-pipeline. So this is like, there's a set of stages and an assembler, and before that you have exactly the same thing again. You can have any pipeline you want in this build instruction. Typically, you only have a DNF uh, stage, that's what we, we do, and what it does, it installs the packages that you need later on in a, in a file system tree, and when you run and spawn, when you run the container, this is then uh, the, um, file system, uh, the, the, the root file system of your container. So yeah, you, you can properly specify all the tools that you have. Right, and that's those built. Those are the principles, and that's the, I like, hope you've given you, you some idea of how it works. And now to applications. Like, how do we, um, uh, how do we use it? So currently, the first project that we are working on now, which is like something to de deliverable to, to people, is uh, Image Builder. And uh, the target, the, the aim of Image Builder is to be able to, thank you, uh, is to be able to build uh, images for cloud providers. So both Fedora and RHEL, we want to be able to uh, generate, um, what's it called? Uh, you want to generate specific images for the specific cloud providers. So we want to, if you want to have Fedora 31 running in Azure or in Amazon, then we have um, Image Builder allowing you to do that. And here you have then a sample running on Fedora. Um, so if you say that, 
um, you want to have a specific version of Fedora running in a specific, specific cloud provider uh, for some specific use case, you can uh, configure uh, some uh, blueprints. So I don't want to get into the details here, but you can, in, you can specify how you want to customize your image. And you can say this, for instance, should be an uh, HTTP server. Uh, and then our tool, using OSPIL as a backend, will produce an image uh, with Apache installed and set up in the correct way uh, with the target uh, cloud provider that you want. We can also do the same for downloading the image, and you can run it locally um, in VMware or in Nspawn or whatever you want, um, and so on. May I? I want to add something. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the whole point why where we're using uh, <clears throat> something like OS build here is that here we kind of need to take a, uh, this is what it means to be a Fedora 31 image, and this is the kind of customizations you want to do on top of it, right? Like I want to install some packages, or put, I, you said something as well, but yeah, add SSH keys or something. Um, and how we're doing this now typically is we, we take a base image and then boot it somewhere and then do all of the changes and then um, do all the customizations that I just talked about. And then, wow, well, this is my gold image now. But now you've booted that and you want to replicate that. It's kind of not a very clean process, I would say, because um, once you've booted it once, it's a little bit weird because you need to like, take some stuff away again, like the machine ID, for example, or random seed or um, Stuff like this. Uh, so, so the idea here is that we have like an OS build pipeline that um, generates the image without ever booting it, uh, but having all of these customizations already baked in. I think that's a very important point that we, that we certainly believe strongly in, is that booting is instantiation. That you can never boot something and then instantiate it afterwards several times. Because all of our, lots of our tools assume that on the first boot you set up some things that are unique to that instance, and then you reuse. And the most, most I mean, the random seed is one thing, but the, the machine ID is very important. That we have made that, that mistake has happened in the past, uh, is that you have ended up with lots of instances with the same machine, machine ID on them. And that's, lots of software assume that that's never going to happen. So we, we absolutely want to avoid that. So no image that we ever produce has been booted before you give it to the customer to instantiate it. Yeah, and it also makes it much easier. Like, oh, I have this OSPL pipeline and it's reproducible. And like, ah, I have a problem with this image. What's going on? Here, this is what I, this is what I built. Here, Tom, please try it out. Can you, you know, do it? And then he has like a way to completely reproduce what I did without having to, you know, ask me about all the steps. Yeah. And uh, I think that concludes our talk. Cool. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please three. Oh, so many questions. Spisek, you're first. Yes. How does the assembly come down? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was: If you may want to build an image for uh, with multiple partitions, how is the assembly of that done? And if I go back to this the big picture here, is that now? So, what you say that you want to have boot and the root effects on, the, on separate partitions? So, like, there's a few things you need to make sure of there, right? You need to tell, tell Grub about it in the configuration, and you need to tell FSTAB about it, but that's just the content of the file system, the configuration on the image that's, that reflects that it's not separate partitions. And then finally, when you make the QCA, so what we do there is, uh, this is quite, in, a lot of steps it goes into making the QCA, and we are thinking of how to se separate these up more to look more like separate stages, but basically what happens here is you, you make a file, which is a, the image file, and then you, you apply the FDisk on it to make the partitions, and you provide the configuration about how the partitions should look like, and so on. So you, you, you would just partition this in as, as you would norm, normally do a disk. And then you copy the stuff over, and then you wrap it up in a QCAM. Does that answer the question? So basically, you, you mount all the partitions. Yes. So, uh, so you're, you're passing the same information that is in FS7, and using that, you mount all of the, you, you partition your disk and you mount all of the, the sub-volumes and you then copy everything over. L uh, uh, you talked about reproducibility and that you wanted functional reproducibility and yes. that's basically fine. But do you have any tool that can add images like superficially? Like yeah. you presume you care about that the file always not generated the same way. Yeah. So how do you do the comparison that images are functionally shown? Uh, yes, so we do. Hmm? Uh, uh, so, uh, good question because I have a nice answer. Uh, <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, we have we have a tool that we, we feed it an image uh, and uh, and then uh, we, we mount the image. We look at the image and we go through all the files on the on the thing and then we, we do the checksums of each of the files. We check all the uh, SE Linux labels and the permissions and and all that stuff and then we also check 
more high-level stuff like the RPMs that are installed, the users that are installed, and so on. We spit out then a huge report, basically, saying what's in, in the image. And then we can we run the thing twice, and you can then see what's, what changes. And basically, the things that we see that changes is that your uh, init ID is different every time, because it's not the way that we produce image studies are not reproducible, and your RPM and DNF databases are different, because the database format is just not stable. But almost everything else on, your, on the images that, that we are producing are exactly the same. Is that true in Canada? Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's in a Git repository. We don't ship it, but it's in a Git repository. And it's called uh, image info. But it's in a different Git repository? It's in one of, the, one of our Git repositories. We might want to move that up. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 So, uh, how well is, right. is so the question is, uh, how does this compare to something like Packer? Lars, would you like to talk about that? Uh, sure. Well, P Packer works in that way that I explained a little bit before, where um, you, you boot up an instance somewhere, right? And then you do all of the modifications, and then you save that as your, your gold image, I think uh, they often say. Um, and, and we think that's the wrong way around. We think we, you cannot boot an image and then make that into a gold image and, and copy it to make many instances out of it. Uh, so that's that's the main difference between the two. Uh, Martin. Uh, can I interrupt the Yosto pipeline in the middle and then kind of cache and store away the current status and then zoom that and then do this several times to try several modifications? Yeah, we do this all the time. Optimize this Docker layer as well? Right, we, we do this all the time. Uh, there, there is no command line switch right now. Repeat the Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was if you can uh, basically interrupt the process at any time and then reuse and cache the result of one of the stages, right? Um, yeah, we do this all the time. Uh, you just, but what we do right now is we just give it a shorter JSON document that's exactly the same because we hashed the, the, uh, that document and we know that we already saw that. Uh, but there's no command line switch right now, but it, we, easy, very easy to add. Yeah. So essentially, essentially you skip the assembler there. Yeah. I, yeah, exactly. Either you use the assembler, or I very, very often just like start off here if I want to like, you know, like see what like what my changes in this stage are. I just like take everything off here because that's the one that takes the longest time because like it uploads, uh, downloads all the packages and and installs them and stuff. Over here. How is this compare from more? Sorry, which one? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I know we looked into it at some point, but it's a little bit too far. But yeah, please come after the talk and we uh, look into it again. Uh, second question: All these steps that you do to manipulate and just after the, all these steps, uh, is, do they add like their own implementation, or do you rely on other tools, external tools, to do some of the work? Uh, yeah. The, as you see, most of them are called even after some of the tools that we have. Sorry, the question was, uh, do we rely on tools that already exist or have our own implementations? Uh, we rely on tools that uh, exist already. That's why they're called like this. Um, the only thing is we have like little wrapper scripts around them so that they can run in that kind of confined environment that we have. But yeah, we do call Grub. We do call, uh, like for the system D1, we do talk, call system control. Um, so we just reuse what, what's already there. Uh, and the biggest uh, challenge in writing these stages is like, we can just call the tools, but the, the problem is usually, as we said, talk about, like I talked about earlier, is that the tools think that they are running on the system that they are installing on. So we just have to make sure that they don't get confused. That's the main, we just have to wrap the tools in the right way, and that, then we, we try as much as possible to reuse the current existing tools. So, thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>